My name is Ms. Blanchard. I teach fifth grade ELA and social studies here in St. Tammany Parish. And I'm also a girls on the run and heart and soul head coach at our school. So I thought it would be awesome to bring you out in my backyard. It's a beautiful day, just like we've had lots of beautiful days. And read a book to you out here next to one of my favorite trees. And so the book that I'm going to read to you is appropriately... The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. So I hope you enjoy. The Giving Tree. Once there was a tree. And she loved a little boy. And every day the boy would come. And he would gather her leaves and make them into crowns and play king of the forest. He would climb up her trunk and swing from her branches and eat apples. And they would play hide and go seek. And when he was tired, he would sleep in her shade. And the boy loved the tree very much. And the tree was happy. But time went by. And the boy grew older. the tree was often alone. Then one day, the boy came to the tree, and the tree said, Come, boy, come and climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and eat apples and play in my shade and be happy. I'm too big to climb and play, said the boy. I want to buy things and have fun. I want some money. Can you give me some money? I'm sorry, said the tree, but I have no money. I have only leaves and apples. Take my apples, boy, and sell them in the city. Then you will have money, and you will be happy. And so the boy climbed up the tree and gathered her apples and carried them away. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time, and the tree was sad. 
And then one day the boy came back and the tree shook with joy. And she said, come, come boys, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I'm too busy to climb trees, said the boy. I want a house to keep me warm, he said. I want a wife and I want children. And so I need a house. Can you give me a house? I have no house, said the tree. The forest is my house, but you may cut off my branches and build a house. Then you will be happy. And so the boy cut off her branches and carried them away to build his house. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time. And when he came back, the tree was so happy she could hardly speak. Come, boy, she whispered. Come and play. I'm too old and sad to play, said the boy. I want a boat that will take me far away from here. Can you give me a boat? Cut down my trunk and make a boat, said the tree. Then you can sail away and be happy. And so the boy cut down her trunk and made a boat and sailed away. And the tree was happy, but not really. And after a long time, the boy came back again. I am sorry, boy, said the tree, but I have nothing left to give you. My apples are gone. My teeth are too weak for apples, said the boy. My branches are gone, said the tree. You cannot swing on them. I'm too old to swing on branches, said the boy. My trunk is gone, said the tree. You cannot climb. I am too tired to climb, said the boy. I am sorry, sighed the tree. <sighs> I wish that I could give you something, but I have nothing left. I am just an old stump. I am sorry. I don't need very much now, said the boy. Just a quiet place to sit and rest. I am very tired. Well, said the tree, straightening herself up as much as she could. Well, an old stump is good for sitting and resting. Come, boy, sit down. Sit down and rest. And the boy did. And the tree was happy. The end. And that was The Giving Tree. I hope you um, have been reading a lot during these times, enjoying the beautiful weather, um, and keep watching. Come back for more videos like this one so we can all keep learning together. You can watch daily lessons on STPPS TV or on our website at stpsb.org. Hope to see you again soon. Bye, guys. Hey boys and girls, my name is Jacqueline Hall and I am a third grade teacher for St. Tammany Parish Public School. In today's lesson, I am going to take you on a nature walk and we are going to collect data according to the animals that we see. So I'm going to take a notebook and a marker with me. I'm going to just jot down any animals that I see and put tally marks next to the animal. So if I see two birds, I'll have two tally marks. If I see eight dogs, then I'll have eight um, tally marks. Then when we get back, we're going to convert our data into a bar graph. And then we are going to compare animals. So let's go. So here is the data that I collected. I saw three birds, one squirrel, five fish, two dogs, and one lizard. So I just made this graph here and I started with one going up and I, I listed all the animals that I saw. So I saw three birds. 
So I am going to grab my marker and I'm going to line it up to the three. So it should look like this. Then I only saw one squirrel, so I'm gonna look at the one and I'm just going to line it up here. Fish, I saw five, so I see the five and I'm just going to line it up way over here. And I'm just making my own bar graph with the data that I collected. Then I saw two dogs, so I see the number two, and I'm just gonna line it up here. And I only saw one lizard. So I'm also going to put the number on top of each one. So here is the official data. Can you tell me how many animals I saw in all? That's right, I saw 12 animals in all. Which animal did I see the most of? That's right, fish. I saw five fish, which was more than any other animal that I saw. Which animal did I see the least of? Correct, I only saw one squirrel and one lizard. How many more birds did I see than dogs? So I saw three birds and two dogs. So whenever I'm comparing and wanting to know how many more birds did I see than dogs, I'm going to subtract. Three minus two is one. So I saw one more bird than I saw dogs. How many dogs and lizards did I see in all? Three, that's right. So when I say in all, that means you have to add. So you added two plus one, which gave us three. How many more fish did I see than birds? That's right, so remember, I'm, I am comparing, so that means I have to subtract five and three. Five minus three is two. Or I can count up from three to five, which would also give me two. I hope you guys enjoyed this video of collecting data and making a bar graph. Um, I hope that you guys go on a nature walk sometime today and do the same thing. My name is Mimi Pecco, and I'm a counselor in the St. Tammany Parish School System. Today I would like to talk to you about our new character trait of the month, humility. Humility is putting others first before ourselves. Some examples of humility are wiping down the countertops, sweeping the floors, folding some laundry, or helping your brothers and sisters with some homework. I would like for you to mention your own examples of humility in the comments section below. We're all in this together. See you soon. Come one, come all to see Miss Sam, the magician of shapes. Today I will be magically making 3D shapes appear before your eyes. Thank you, thank you. Today's shapes are rectangular prism, pyramid, cone, cube, cylinder, and last but not least, sphere. To set the stage, we're going to need some more lighting. Much better. All right, guys. So. Before we get started, there's some things you need to know about 3D shapes that are very important. First of all, they're 3D, meaning they pop up. 
not flat like 2D shapes, which are more like a pancake or a piece of paper. Flat. No, 3D shapes pop up. Another important thing about 3D shapes is you can see how many faces they have. Now the faces are the flat parts. It'll make more sense once we start making some 3D shapes up here. Now, let's get started by making a rectangular prism up here. Now I'm going to say my magic words, abracadabra. Please say them with me. Ready? Abracadabra! We've made a tissue box up here. But is it a rectangular prism? Only one way to find out. I know that a rectangular prism has six rectangular faces. Now do you remember what a face is? Yes, it's the flat part of a 3D shape. Let's see if it has six rectangular faces. One, two, three, four, five, six. Does that mean it's a rectangular prism? Yes, it does. We've done it. We've made one rectangular prism appear. Let's see. Next, we're going to make a pyramid appear. Are you ready? Say the magic words with me. Abracadabra! Voila! A pyramid! Looking at this and thinking about what I know about pyramids, I'm not so sure this is one. A pyramid I know has four triangular faces. Do you see any triangular faces? Me either. Do you see one square face? I see a circular face. Is this a pyramid? No. Right. Let's try this again. Okay, think about what we just talked about, about pyramids. One more time, my friends. Abracadabra! Have we done it, my friends? Let us see. Does it have four triangular faces? This is definitely a triangular face. Let's count. One, two, three, four. Four triangular faces. But wait, there's one more thing it needs. A square face. Look at the bottom. Is it square? It is? That means this is indeed a pyramid. Good job, my friends. Bravo. Fantastic work. Let's keep going. Our next 3D shape would be a cone. Remember, we're going to say our magic words together. Ready? Abracadabra! One way to find out. Let's check. A cone has just one face on the bottom, and it's a circle. Let's check it. All right. This part he has so far appears not to have any faces on the side. Yes, the bottom is indeed circular. It has one circular face. Is it a cone? Indeed it is! Oh, we are just doing fabulous. All right, time to say goodbye to the party hat, our cone. Now I'm going to make a cube up here. All right, get ready my friends. This time I want you to say it loud! Abracadabra! We have done it again. In our magic was so powerful together, we've made two things of here. Oh, I cannot wait to see if they're actually cubes. The first one seems a bit small, yes. So, a cube should have six square faces. Let us see if we have indeed made a cube. Count with me. One, two, 
three, four, five, and six. Is this a cube, my friends? Yes, it is. One more thing, what do we have here? Oh, yes, a game cube. It does have the word cube in its name, but is it really a cube? Let's find out. How many faces did a cube have? Of course, six. Here we go. See if it has six square faces. One, two, three, four, five, and six. The game cube lives up to its name. It is indeed a cube. Yes, we're doing so good, my friends. Cylinder is next on our grand list. All right, are you ready? Once more, say the magic words with me. Abracadabra! Voila! A cylinder. Now, I'm not so sure if this is a cylinder. Let me think. What I remember about cylinders is they have two circular faces. Circular face? No. About this? Not a circular face either. In fact, I'm not seeing any circular faces. I only see six. six rectangular faces. What 3D shape had six rectangular faces? That's right. The rectangular prism. We've already made one of those. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. We will try one more time to make a cylinder. Focus really hard on what you know a cylinder looks like. Two circular faces. One more time, my friends. Abracadabra! One, two, three things. Our magic is so strong. All right. Cylinder had how many faces? Two. In what shape? Circle. Start with our paper towel roll. Does it have two circular faces? One, two. He's a cylinder. Ooh. What's this? A soup can. Does he have two circular faces? One, two. He indeed is also a cylinder. Time for our last one. Just the roll part of the paper towels. Is he a cylinder? One circular side, two. He indeed is also a cylinder. All right, we're moving on to the final one, a sphere. Now for this one, I want you to use your most powerful voice when you're thinking about creating our sphere, our rounded friend. Okay, remember big, powerful, magic words. Abracadabra! We've made three balls up here, but is it a sphere? Remember, a sphere should have no faces, just be completely round. See any faces, which means this must be a sphere! We've done it! What? Oh no! The magic was too powerful! Oh goodness! I'll have to head of this! Miss Sam signing off! Hi, I'm Brian Dial, St. Tammany Parish Public School System PE teacher. And today, for our lesson, I'd like to just teach you a few simple body weight exercises so that you can get a total body workout in your own home without any equipment. Now, I'm going to teach you a lower body, a core, and an upper body exercise, and then a variation of each one so that you can experiment to see which one fits your level of fitness best. When we're talking about personal fitness, remember, only you matter. Don't compare yourself to anyone else. Just work on making yourself better. Our first Every exercise day. is going to be the goblet squat. The goblet squat's named that because we're going to be holding our hands like we're holding a goblet or a cup. I like to teach 
the goblet squat so that we learn to keep our body in an upright position because you don't want to spill the water out of the goblet. So the first thing you do is you stand about shoulder width apart. Your toes can either point straight forward or outward a little bit. Imagine if it's a clock, instead of having your toes on the 12s, have them point one at the 11 and one at the one o'clock. So your feet are pointed out a little bit. And if you're taller, your feet might be a little wider than shoulder width. Find what's comfortable for you. Now we're gonna hold our hands like a goblet, like we're holding a cup of water so we don't spill it. And then we're gonna slowly bend our knees until our tops of our legs are parallel with the floor. If we can get that low while keeping our feet flat. If not, bend your knees as far as you can go while keeping your feet flat and your back straight. Let's watch right here, going down nice and slow. Nice and slow. Let's look from the side, you'll see the key to the goblet squat is that the very first movement your hip makes is backwards. You don't go down first, it's back. Watch my hip right here. The very first thing it's gonna do as I start is go backward and then down. Backward and then down. That's the goblet squat. Feet shoulder width apart. Hands holding your goblet so we don't spill the water. Toes straight forward or pointed out a little bit. Slowly bend your knees so that you can keep your feet flat and go down so the top of your legs are parallel with the floor. Another variation of a lower body exercise is the split squat. In the split squat, we're going to be working one leg at a time, so it's a little bit tougher. You need to stand so that your feet are on what we call different train tracks. Your feet are not behind each other. One of them is on this side of an imaginary line, the other one is on the other side of the imaginary line. They're both still about shoulder width apart, maybe a little more narrow. Your back foot is gonna be up on its toe. Your front foot stays flat, and the secret to the split squat is that we go straight down. We're not gonna drive our front knee forward, we're going to drive our hips straight down so that our back knee gets close to the ground. Like this. Down. And then up. Down. And then up. Let's watch from the side. You'll see again, this time my hip goes straight down. I've already opened it up by stepping backwards. Down. And then up. Down. Notice this front knee is not going forward. It's staying straight over its ankle. That's the split squat. That's a little tougher variation of a lower body exercise. Now we're going to move to the upper body. First upper body exercise I'm going to teach you is the push-up. It's important to remember three things when we're doing our basic push-up. First, your hands should be under your shoulders and a little wider than shoulder width. We don't want our hands way out in front of our body. We don't want our hands behind our shoulders. Second, we want to keep a nice straight line from the head through the neck through the shoulders, our torso, through our hips, through our legs, through our knees, and our ankles of our body. Nice straight line. We don't want our back to arch up like a teepee. We don't want our back to be curved like a seal. Third, we need to raise and lower our body like an elevator as one unit. We don't want part of the elevator to go up while the other part of the elevator stays down. Let's watch and see. Hands underneath your shoulders. Eyes looking straight down at the ground in between your hands. Don't look at your toes. That'll make your back arch up. And we just slowly lower and raise. One unit. Nice and smooth. Nice and smooth. That was our basic push-up. Now, if you're not able to do a basic push-up, one modification you can do is called the negative push-up. With the negative push-up, we're only working on the lowering. Everything else stays the same. So we're gonna get our hands under our shoulders, get our good straight line, and then we're just gonna slowly bend our arms, go down, and when we can't hold it anymore, just relax. Then get back up to our position, slowly bend our elbows, and when we get down, just relax and get back up to our position. 
using the negative push-up allows you to work out at your level of fitness. One more modification you can do if you're not able to perform the basic push-up is what we call a knee push-up. When we do a knee push-up, we still want to keep our straight line from our head through our shoulders, our body, to our hips, to our knees. But we're going to take our feet up off the ground to make ourselves a little lighter and able to handle the weight. So here, I will get in my knee push-up position. Notice there's still a straight line. And then I just bend and straight. And bend and straight. Nice, easy elbow movements. Notice my whole body moves like a teeter-totter. That's the knee push-up. Now let's move to the core. The first exercise I'm going to teach you is called the plank. Just like a plank of wood, our objective is to keep our body perfectly straight. We're going to support our weight with our forearms and our toes. Everything else is being held off of the ground using our core muscles. We want to keep our eyes looking straight down at the ground, not up and not down at your toes, because that's going to cause our plank to have a curve to it. Let's hold this for about 10 seconds. We're going to start. Let's put my forearms on the ground, toes on the ground, nice and tight. Two, three, four, five, hold it. Six, good. Eight, nine, 10. The plank is a simple exercise, but if you start to hold it for longer and longer periods of time, you're definitely going to feel it in your core. Our last exercise I'm going to teach you is the Superman. In Superman, we're going to use our core and a little bit of our upper back to pull our arms and legs up off of the ground. First thing I'm going to do is lay here on my belly, arms outstretched. Feet outstretched, just like I was flying. And then I'm going to use my upper back and core muscles to pull my hands and feet off the ground. Hold it, four, five, relax. Two, three, four, hold it. Two, three, four, relax. Two, three, four. That's the Superman. Now we're going to put it all together in a total body workout. We're going to use a descending pyramid rep scheme, which means we're going to do four of each exercise, then three, then two, then one, so it's going to get a little bit easier each time. You guys ready to go? All right, you can choose whichever of the exercise that you like. I'm going to go ahead and choose whichever ones I like and follow along. Let's start with our lower body. Four lower body. You're going to do split squat, alternate. Ready? And let's go. Four, three, two, one. Now upper body. Push ups. Four, three, two, one. Now let's do Superman. If you choose plank, just hold it for 10 seconds. Four, three, two, one. Now we're back up. Goblet squats again. Remember, feet shoulder width. Hold your water, hips back first. Three, two, Go ahead and do our negatives. Three, two, one. We do some more Superman. Three, two, one. Let's go ahead. Little split squat now. Good. I got two push ups coming. One, two. Go ahead and hold our plank now. One, 
Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed our fitness lesson and remember to watch more videos like this so we can all keep learning together. Lessons like this can be seen daily on the St. Tammany Parish television channel or on the school board website. Have a great day.
is Miss Lakeen, and I am a third grade teacher here in St. Tammany Parish. I am so excited to get to be with all of you today and to get to do a little science experiment because science is always fun, right? Um, today you will need a few supplies. You're going to need two pieces of loose leaf. You're going to need four books, 20 pennies, and tape and scissors and a ruler if you have one. You can definitely do this without a ruler. And I really, really want you to go ahead and do this experiment along with me anytime you need to pause the video to maybe try something out, to build your own design, change it, modify it. I want you to do that because you're going to learn way more doing it yourself than just watching me do it. So the whole idea for this experiment all came to me the other day when my two nieces were outside and they were playing a game of tug of war. And if you're not familiar with the game of tug of war, it looks kind of like this. Usually you have one person on each side of a rope or maybe uh, two equal groups on one side of the rope. And the goal of the game is to pull the rope towards you and to get this little flag tied in the middle to come closer to your team. And when we were playing it, we had a little pool of water underneath the flag, so that way whoever lost would also end up falling in the pool and get wet and have a little more fun. So I was watching my two nieces play this and it was just the two of them pulling against one another. And it was so strange they sat there, I would say almost five minutes, pulling the rope towards one another, and it never moved. That little flag in the middle almost stayed completely still. This obviously started frustrating them because nobody likes a tie, that's no fun. So I decided I would play. So I um, stepped up and I played against one of my nieces and almost as soon as I pulled the rope, boom, she went right into the pool and got soaking wet. So I had my other niece come up. I said, all right, well, that wasn't very fun. That was too fast. Why don't you play against me? So as soon as she came up and we counted one, two, three, pulled the rope, and maybe 10 seconds later, she was in the pool too. So it really got me thinking. That's just so strange. How come when they were playing, the rope didn't move at all? And then when I played with them, I mean, the game didn't even last a minute, and the rope pulled right towards me. I do know from science that if an object is not moving, then the forces that are acting upon it are balanced, right? I know that when an object does move, then that means the forces that are acting upon it are unbalanced. But I was really wondering what causes that to happen? And that's sort of the question I wanna explore with you today. What causes balanced forces to become unbalanced? What causes unmoving objects to start moving. And the way we're gonna explore this is actually through building a bridge. Because a bridge is something that an engineer definitely wants to make sure the forces are balanced upon because you don't want your bridge to break or collapse. So the way we're gonna build our bridge is we're gonna take our books and we're gonna place two books on each side. It's gonna act like maybe our land or our buildings that our bridge is gonna connect. So I just have some cookbooks here if you wanna use textbooks or whatever you have laying around that's fine. You just want them to be pretty equal in height. And then we're gonna take one of our two pieces of paper and lay them across the books. And you want your books to be close enough so that way your bridge makes a pretty nice horizontal line parallel with the ground. So I've got my paper across here, looks pretty straight. Okay, we build our bridge. I mean, it looks like it's holding up perfectly, right? I do know that gravity is always pulling all objects towards the earth. So gravity's pulling on this bridge right now and seems to be working fine. I think I just kind of hit it out of the park first try. Hmm, but hang on a second. There are some other forces that act upon a bridge, right? Sometimes people might walk across them and that'll push down on the bridge. Sometimes cars drive across them. That can really push down on the bridge. So this is where our pennies are gonna come into play. We're gonna use our pennies to act as if they are the people or the cars, depending on what kind of bridge it is, that are pushing down on our bridge. So I would like our bridge to be able to hold up 20 pennies while the forces are still balanced. So let's see how my design right now does. One, two, not looking so good. Oh man, only two. So although it did work initially, once we added more downward force, not so great. So what I want you to do is go ahead and pause the video and I want you to come up with your own design or you can modify the design that I have here using, remember your paper, 
your scissors, your glue, and your ruler, or your uh, tape if you don't have glue, and see if you can improve upon my bridge so that it can hold up 20 pennies, or at least more than two, right? So usually when I go to build a design, I like to kind of plan it out first, draw it, and then build my model. So I'm gonna kind of draw what we have so far. Right, here's our land or our books. And so far we really just have kind of a straight beam across them. And that's our paper. And we already talked about, I know that gravity's pulling down on my bridge. And then when we added the pennies to act as if it were a car or a person, I know that that's also pushing down on my bridge. So looking at this, I'm realizing, well, there's a lot of force pushing down on my bridge. And if I want it to be balanced, maybe I need something that's gonna push up on my bridge. But how could I do that? All I have is paper. Hmm, I have an idea. So I live really close to the causeway bridge that goes across Lake Pontchartrain. And I've noticed when I drive across it, it makes these kind of bumps as you're going across where there's these pillars underneath it, right? Almost like a column. I'm wondering if those columns help to push back up on the bridge. That if I build some pillars underneath it, that upward force will help to balance out all the downward force. So I think that's the idea I'm gonna try first. And we can see how it goes, right? We can always change it if it doesn't work. This is where I am gonna use my ruler so that I can measure the height of my bridge. And it'll just make cutting those pillars a little easier. All right, so it looks like we're right at seven centimeters. My bridge isn't too big. I think I'm just gonna make two pillars. And like I said before, if I need to add more or change it, that's the fun thing about science. And that's the good thing about building a model is you can make as many mistakes as you want. Okay. I'm gonna cut my paper right here to create my two pillars. And then I'm gonna roll them up. And then I'm gonna use the tape just to secure the pillar so they don't unroll. Maybe they'll be a little more stable that way. I wish I could see the designs you came up with. And remember, if you did something different than pillars, that's fine. We'll test them together and we'll see whose design ends up working best. Probably came up with something a little more creative than I did. Okay, let's take this one. And slide it under. Put one in the front and one in the back. And let's see how this goes. Remember my original design only held up two pennies. So I'll be happy if we improve upon that. But my goal is really for it to be able to hold all 20 pennies. All right, so are you ready to test yours? Let's see how it goes. And if you don't have 20 pennies laying around, you can use any kind of coin that you want. Um, I would say try and use the same type of coin, or you could even use buttons or something like that, but just that way you're adding the same amount of mass each time. All right, let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we're definitely doing better than last time, eight, nine, 10, 11, I dropped two, 12, 13, 14, 15, five more, 16, 17, 18, oops, I dropped one, 19, oh man. Well, at least I know it held 19. I need that 20th penny, but it slipped underneath my kitchen counter somewhere. That's the fun of doing science at home, right? Either way, I know I definitely improved upon my design. It was able to hold 19 pennies. I have a feeling, because it looks pretty stable, that it could probably hold 20 pennies as well. So, if your design didn't work out, that's fine. Go ahead and modify it and change it. If it did work out, I challenge you, could you maybe hold 100 pennies? 
Could you build a longer bridge or a taller bridge? You could even try out some different supplies, maybe popsicle sticks, straws, pasta, whatever you kind of have laying around the house. There are um, some other designs you could go for too. If you did pillars like me, you could maybe try out like an arch bridge or you could do a suspension bridge. Maybe use some string and some uh, toothpicks, that would be cool. Or a truss bridge. Um, no matter what you try, every time you're gonna get to learn and kind of understand a little bit more about physics and especially those balanced and unbalanced forces. So that can be really fun. Let's kind of bring this back to my tug of war game though, right? What did we kind of learn from this that relates to the tug of war game that I was playing with my nieces? Well, we know with our bridge that originally it didn't move because the forces were balanced. And what caused the forces to become unbalanced and cause our bridge to move was when we added more force pushing down in one direction, right? So there was more force going in one direction and that caused the bridge to collapse. So in our tug of war game, which I kind of sketched out for you here, I'm a very good artist. In our tug of war game, there must have been more force going in one direction. So if I know, think about my niece, I know for sure she was pulling the rope towards her. She wasn't just letting me win. And I also know I was pulling the rope towards me. And that's the direction the rope moved in. So I'm thinking I must have pulled with more force towards me. And that's why the rope moved in my direction. The force was unbalanced when I pulled with more force than my niece was able to pull. Hmm. At least that's kind of what I'm thinking was happening. But I bet the more that you're able to experiment and build with your bridges, the better you're probably gonna understand what was happening in this strange tug of war game. No matter what, I had so much fun learning with you and to do this experiment with you. I hope you had a great time too, and I'll talk to you later, bye. Right behind me is our state flower, the magnolia. It starts off as these buds and opens up. And then 
really opens up into this beautiful, beautiful flower. Our state flower is the Southern Magnolia. You know it's the Southern Magnolia because of its big white petals. They have six to 12 petals on each flower. They bloom from the month of April to June and they do not produce any nectar, but lots of pollen. I am now going to teach you how to draw a southern magnolia. We're going to start off drawing the stems. Um, so you want to begin just like a little curve. Then we're gonna go on the outside to give it a little bit more thickness. And let's have another branch coming out over here. And maybe another one. We're going to be drawing um, the Southern Magnolia just about to bloom. Cause right now, they're starting, they've budded and they're starting to bloom, but they haven't bloomed quite yet. So I'm going to draw what most of the magnolias look like right now. So I'm going to do kind of like a tear shaped. And that's going to be the base of the magnolia. And I'll have another one coming up on this side. Let's have maybe another petal coming out here. And let's have what kind of drooping because I see a lot of it, the petals kind of falling out or falling in. They have a lot of depth, the Southern Magnolia petals. Now we're going to just continue adding on to our flower because the Southern Magnolia has many, many petals. It has six to 12 petals. So we're just going to kind of go around and I think I'll make another one here. A young one, not quite opening up yet. Let's have another petal here. Let's make another petal here. Yeah. Okay. So now let's add the leaves. Because remember this is Southern Magnolia is on a tree and they have these huge deep green leaves that come out. And so I'm going to just attach a few here. Now all we want to add is a little bit of um, details, maybe those little folds that we see in the petals and maybe some shadows that come on the branches. So here's my Southern Magnolia. I can color it. I'll probably keep the petals white and color those leaves that deep, deep green and the stem brown. I'm excited to see yours. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit about our state flower, the Southern Magnolia. <laughs>